By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today I have another beautiful, fantastic old school magic match for you. I am playing in it, so it might be worth your while. <laughs> I'm not just kidding, but I am playing in it and I'm playing against a pretty cool dude. I'm playing against Nicolas. And uh, Nicolas has uh, made a nice blue, black, and white mid-range control deck. Can I say that? You know, in a moment, I'm going to show it to you and we're going to go through the whole deck. I can already say that I'm really liking the Sengir Vampires and Sarah Angels in this deck. And I am battling him with my Tron deck. And uh, maybe you've seen the Tron deck on the channel before. So it's white and it's red. And it's got all the Tron lands in it. And I've made some minor changes that I'm really looking forward to try out and kind of share with you and discuss the deck and share my thoughts. Now, before I dive into the deck deck of these decks, I think I'm going to start with the deck of Nicholas. I would first just like to point out that as always, you can also skip the deck deck section and the intro for that matter by checking the description below. There you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games. Click on there and that will take you straight to the action. And as for here, we are going to start with the deck deck. I'm going to look at the deck of my lovely opponent, Nicholas. Let's take a look. And here we have the deck of my opponent, Nicholas. And um, as you notice or may notice is that there are a lot of altars in this deck. That has a reason because Nicholas also makes altars. So before I go into the ins and outs of this deck, I just want to zoom into that part of Nicholas, give a little shout out to his Facebook page. You know what? I'll just show you a screenshot of his page. Uh, let's have a look. Let's get that up on the screen. So it's facebook.com slash Wizorior A, Wizorior Alters. And as you can see, he's got some pretty cool Moxon Alters there that, of course, he did himself. And um, one of the Alters, I actually asked him to send it to me. Well, not send the Alter, the card itself. Would have been lo lovely, but I'm talking about a close-up picture of the card. And that is the Black Lotus. So here you see the Altered Black Lotus, so made by himself. I think it's so cool because you see so many old school cards in here. This is really a picture. Maybe you're pausing this right now and taking a moment to really look at this art and get it all into your system. There's so much happening here. Um, you know, I see Sarah Angel, you see Counterspell, Script Sprites. They're just, you know what? I'm not going to mention them all because it's much more fun for you to look at this picture and try to, to, to find them all in the artwork beautiful and i know when it comes to altars there are of course different opinions like with everything in magic and uh, that's good you know that's all good i know some people here you see the original by the way the original black lotus i know that some people say always keep the original um no matter how busted it is other people say if it's really damaged it's okay to alter other people say i only want the original artist to alter it which is going to be hard with the black lotus by the way because of Christopher Rush, of course. Some people say, I don't want anything signed. Others like it signed. And it's just, I, I, I love that about our hobby is that there are so many different opinions and, and everybody has their own personal reasons why they like one thing or another. I personally really like this Black Lotus altar. And I think when your card is so heavily damaged, it makes sense to alter it, especially when you're as talented as Nicholas here. So really, really good. So this is kind of the part where I talk about my opponent as an artist, but now we're gonna talk about him as a magic player. Let's take a look at his deck. And I have to say, Nicholas, you're a little bit spiky, man. You're a little bit spiky. <laughs> uh, you know, when we're looking at his deck, uh, what I notice is uh, there are some the deck elements in this deck. And what I also notice is that you've chosen not to just splash in the usual suspect. So you've really chosen to go with three colors, white, blue, and black, and you haven't splashed in a Wheel of Fortune or Regrowth, for example. You've really said, you know, I'm going to stick to these colors. And in those colors, we do see a lot of the usual suspects, which makes sense because they're, you know, good cards, strong cards, Disenchant, Swords, Balance, that's your standard white package. We see, of course, the blue power. Then what's interesting about your blue chunk of cards is we don't see any counter spells. We do see one mana drain, but no counter spells. I guess instead of those counter spells, you've made some space for sinkhole. We see three sinkholes, which I think is quite interesting. I would really see this more as a kind of mid-range control deck. And those sinkholes, of course, are going to give you some tempo advantage. If you can have those sinkholes early and also with your Moxen and your Felwerstone and your Black Lotus, you have a lot of tempo acceleration. And then you can get, 
you know, you're saying your vampire out and your Sarah Angel out. Talking about that, I think it's really cool that you're playing with six of those four four flyers. I always love seeing Sangir. Sarah Angel, you see it so much, but of course it's a beautiful and really good creature, so I do get it. Um, really cool to see these beefy flyers in your deck. When I'm looking at your mana base, I think you can you can pull it off. You can pull off the double white, the double blues, the double blacks. Um, and I'm sure you've experienced that it, it works, you know, because you've been tweaking this deck, you told me, uh, for, for a while now. Um, but there is, of course, an elephant in room here, and that is Blood Moon. I think if your deck runs into a Blood Moon, it's going to be tough because you're not playing any basic lands. I'm sure you know this. You do, of course, have the Moxon and the Black Lotus, so they're, they will be able to generate some colored mana that you may need. Um, and of course, the Flower Stone is not going to work anymore when Blood Moon's on the battlefield. So that is a little bit risky. On the other hand, you know, what's life without a risk? And of course, you can always board in your blue elemental blasts when you're facing a possible Blood Moon. And guess what? Your opponent today, he's playing a Blood Moon. <laughs> it's, it is in the sideboard. You know what? Let's take a look at my deck and then I can show you what I'm talking about. And here we see my deck Orbitron, named after Winter Orb and the Tron Lands, because yes, there are Tron Lands in here. And I know that Tron is, in all the other formats, uh, what are they called, modern and all that stuff, um, is really good. But in old school, it's, it's cool to play with Tron, you know, and I really respect people playing with Tron. One of the things I love about the Swedish rule set is that actually Tron is kind of doable. And I'm saying doable, I'm not saying good. I'm saying it's doable in Swedish. The reason it's harder in other formats is very simple. For example, when you've got a four strip mine environment like Eternal Central, it's gonna be really, really tough. When you're playing, for example, Atlantic, you only play with one strip, but you can play with four workshops. And when you can play with four workshops, why would you then play with Tron, right? Unless you go full on artifacts, which is pretty cool, but very vulnerable. So, um, you know, I, I, I truly think, but feel free to change my mind if you have a different uh, opinion, that Swedish is the perfect format to play with Tron. So how does Tron work again? So if you have uh, Urza's Tower, Urza's Power Plant, and Urza's Mine together on a battlefield at the same time, you get a bonus, right? When you tap Urza's Tower, you get three mana. When you tap a Power Plant or a Mine, you get two mana instead of the normal one. But you need to have all three lands on the battlefield. So of course, that is something that I'm hoping for. And when I can accomplish that, I'll be able to play my Triskelions out really, really cheaply. I'll be able to play out all the extra cards that I'm drawing from my Howling Mine really quickly because I've got enough mana. And of course, I know it's not the most original way to win the game, but I can play a huge Disintegrate or Fireball and kill my opponent on the spot. But I think that's kind of fair when you're playing Tron. You know, I, I, I used to play this with um, Colossus of Sardia, which I still think is awesome, but... It's just really difficult to play with Colossus of Sardia. I know some people, uh, I know Kundert, one of the viewers of this channel, uh, if you're watching this Kundert, he made a really cool Tron deck with Sword of the Ages and Colossus of Sardia and stuff in it. Also really awesome. But I'm trying to make this a little bit more... Um, I want this to also to work when I don't have Tron. Let me put it that way. And how am I trying to accomplish this? I've chosen to go for the Parfait package. So Parfait is all about the two cards that get deactivated, the two artifacts, the only two artifacts in old school that get deactivated by tapping them. And those two artifacts are Winter Orb and Howling Mine. So if you tap the Winter Orb, then it means that I get to, or the Winter Orb doesn't work anymore. So if I tap it at the right time, it means that I get to untap all my lands. And then of course, I'm also untapping my Winter Orb in that process. And then I'm gonna keep my Winter Orb untapped until the end step of my opponent so that my opponent can only untap one land at a time, right? And how am I gonna do that? Simple, I've got three Relic Barriers and two Icy Manipulators. Especially Relic Barrier is just ideal. Just two to cast, it's from Legends. Tap and tap target artifact. It's as simple as that. And I have to say, Relic Barrier, also a great card if you're not playing Parfait. If you're not playing this strategy, it's still great, I think. And you do see it now, for example, in some Mono Black decks. I think it's a great way to deal with Moxen, Factories, and there's just always an artifact usually on the battlefield that's worth tapping, right? So just, just kind of a little shout out for Relic Barrier. I think it should see more play. Um, and then we also have Howling Mine. So Howling Mine, of course, 
the lovable card that lets you and your opponent draw an extra card during the draw step. So you get to draw two cards instead of one card. Now here's the nasty plan that I have with Parfait. I wanna tap my Howling Mine after my own draw step so that I'm the only person that draws two cards and my opponent, he only draws one. Sorry, but that's my big plan. Of course, you do have to have Winter Orb, Howling Mine, and then or your Relic Barrier or your Ice Manipulator on the battlefield to have this Parfait work. You need to have a way to tap down those two artifacts. One of the reasons I think this works well with Tron is that uh, Winter Orb and Tron work really well because with Winter Orb, you can only untap one land, but if that one land is an Urza's Tower, it's still gonna give you three mana instead of one mana. So that works really well. So even if you don't have a Relic Barrier to tap your Orb and your Orb also works for you, it can still kind of be in your favor. Howling Mine, I think works great with Tron for the simple reason that you can draw into more cards. If you can draw into more cards, you have a bigger way to kind of draw into your Tron. Once you draw into your Tron, you have more mana. So it's really easy to play out all those cards that you're drawing all the time with Howling Mine. So that's kind of really, in my opinion, really good synergy. Um, but then also I wanna have some payoff cards. What are you gonna do when you have Tron, right? And like I mentioned earlier, then I'm able to play a cheap trike. I'm able to use my uh, Taunus' Coffin perhaps in the, as, in the same turn that I play it. I can maybe use it as well. Taunus' Coffin, you pay three and tap it. You can put target creature in Taunus' Coffin. It's kind of exiled with all the cards on it, with all the counters on it. And then when it comes back, it has all the ETB triggers again. Hear that? I'm using complicated words. Moving up in the world. So ETB means uh, enters the battlefield triggers. So when the Triskelion comes back onto the battlefield, it still has the three plus one plus one counters, but will then get additional three plus one plus one counters when it enters the battlefield. It does enter the battlefield tapped, but that doesn't really matter for the counters because it can just shoot them off whether or not the Triskelion is untapped or tapped. So before you know it, you'll have a 7-7 seven, seven trike, and more importantly so, you have six points of damage that you can divide any way you choose, and then you can simply put it back into the coffin again, and it's gonna come out of there with even more counters on it. So that's just fantastic, right? So I've got the trikes, and then the other payoff, of course, is Disintegrate and Fireball, like I mentioned earlier. And then I'm also playing, just like my opponent Nicholas, with the Business White. I think I should start calling it Business White. So three Disenchants, three Swords, and a Balance. The reason I've chosen to add white here, and for example, not blue, because maybe you're wondering, no copy artifacts, why is that? The reason I chose to go with white is, white gives me control, white can buy me time. If I have, if I'm not drawing into the Tron lands, if I'm having a bit of a shaky start, at least I can just find a disenchant or a swords, and they can do business. A swords will just take care of a creature, I don't have to think about it anymore, I don't have to counter it or bounce it or find a certain moment in the game or blah, 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 no. One white, creature's gone, I can move on with my life. And I think that's a really good thing about white. Another card that I think goes really good in this deck, a white card is balance, because balance doesn't count the artifacts. It does count the artifact creatures, but it doesn't count the Moxon, the Soul Ring, um, you know, the, um, the Winter Orbs, the Relic Barriers, the um, Howling Mine, the City in a Bottle. So if I have those cards out, it's not gonna count them, and that means that my balance becomes stronger because it becomes more like a Mind Twist and a Wrath of God in one. I mean, it can just be, balance can be so brutally good, especially when you're behind. Anyway, this is my deck. These are my cards. Um, oh yeah, the changes I've made in this deck, because maybe you're wondering, you talked about some changes in the intro. I've added an ATOC to the deck. First, it was an Argivian Archaeologist. Now, I love Argivian Archaeologist, but the problem is it's too white in the casting cost and also too white to use. So it's just too much white mana when you already have so much colorless mana. Look at my slots. I only have eight sources of white mana, right? And I just it's just not enough to be able to really use the Archaeologist. So I've chosen to go with an ATOC, and obviously ATOC works fantastic in this deck with so many artifacts. And um, the other difference I, I've made is I've added uh, Atonis' Coffin. Earlier I played with four swords to plowshares, but I thought, you know what, if I play with three swords and Atonis' Coffin, that's going to be good as well. So those are the two changes that I've made, so I'm really looking forward to kind of see how that works out. Hopefully I get to cast both of those cards and I get to test them out. Anyway, uh, this is my deck. Oh, check my sideboard, you see those Blood Moons I talked about. Um, we looked at the deck of my opponent, Nicholas, I guess we're ready. Let's go to the games. Game number one, here we go. It looks like we're still throwing the dice, rolling the dice. 
the die, I should say. Anyway, we're figuring out who, who gets to start. I believe Nicholas, the player on the left, is going to start. So he's playing with the um, black, white, and blue mid-range deck. It looks like he's taking a mulligan here. Of course, I'm sitting on the right with the Timmy playmat. There we see him shuffling up. And uh, yeah, so that's not a great start for Nicholas. Having to take that mulligan, it's always... When you're also on the plane, you have to take a mulligan. It kind of feels extra tough. So he's going to take a new fresh seven. Then he has to put one card on the bottom. But first he has to decide if he wants to keep or not. Looking at it. Trying to decide what to do. I'm going through my hand as well. It looks like I am keeping, by the way. And he's going to put a card. No, he's going to take another mulligan. Oof. Nicholas, that is not a great start for you of this match. Kind of feel bad for you now that you have to go down to five cards. So it's five cards against seven. Ooh. It, does this already mean that I have that game number one? Well, not necessarily. He does play, of course, with um, the Time Twister, which would be a great comeback. He plays with Balance. He also plays with Ancestral Recall. And, you know, and maybe Luck's on his side after being really unlucky. I mean, I've, I've seen people win who started with five cards win games. But it is going to be difficult, of course, for Nicholas. Really difficult. And is he going to keep this hand then? He's got to put two cards on the bottom. It's got to be tough. That's one. That's two. So it looks like, yeah, he's going to keep it. Okay, so it looks like we're on our way now. Getting my hand as well. There we see a scrub land and a pass. So the dual land, white and black. I'm playing an Urza's mine and passing turn here. Let's see what he can do. Hopefully he does have a land. Okay, there's a Mishra's factory and a pass. At least my deck is not really fast. Although if, if I can get like turn two, a relic barrier and a howling mine and stuff, then it's pretty good. Okay, there we see a relic barrier. Okay, so if I can get into... A howling my next turn and relic barrier also being really useful against the mistress factory by the way and how i usually work with the tron lands if i put the one tron land on top of the other i'm kind of showing that they're both mines or towers or power plants kind of to help my opponent identify the tron lands that i have there he's playing a tundra and passing turn so relic barrier of course being great against that mistress factory another mine I wonder, do I have, there is a Mox Ruby, there's a Suchi. Okay, so there's not a Howling Mine, but there is a Suchi. And because of that Mox Ruby, I was able to accelerate for one mana. Are we now going to see, oh, I want to say a Disenchant, but we're going to see a Psy Blast instead. So he's going to take damage. Now, there's no mana burn in Swedish. That's why you're not seeing me take four points of damage here. I'm just going to stay on 20. But of course, Nicholas is taking two damage from his own Psy Blast. And there is a Winter Orb. Ooh, and a Howling Mine. And because of that Winter Orb, Nicholas is now only able to untap one land. And I've tapped my own Howling Mine, deactivating it, meaning Nicholas only gets to draw one, but I get to draw two. So now I'm getting card advantage, and I already had card advantage because Nicholas started with five. Oh, this is looking really, really tough. For Nicholas, finding a second Relic Barrier, not having a land drop. There is a Disenchant on the Winter Orb. There is an untap. Oh man, this is really tough for Nicholas. He's got to find another Disenchant to get rid of the Howling Mine. Tapping four here, and there's an Icy Manipulator. Okay, that could kind of work. Now, of course, I can tap the Icy with my second Relic. That's exactly what I do on his end step. I'm going to untap here, drawing two cards as well. So that's two cards drawn extra. Plus I started with two extra cards. There is an Urza's Tower. Tapping down my Howling Mind, playing another Suchi. And this is going to be tough because I have that Relic Barrier still untapped. So I can use that to tap down his Icy Manipulator. So that he cannot use it during my turn when I want to attack with Suchi. I'm kind of talking about my turn that's coming up next. But first, let's see what Nicholas can do. Nicholas untapping his lands and his Icy. Playing out a beautiful Mox Sapphire there. The altar made by himself. 
Tapping two, tapping, okay, tapping four, tapping five, Sarah Angel. Sarah Angel, four, four flyer. I wonder if I'm going to offer him the trade. I guess I will. It's a pretty good trade. Drawing two again, and I'm drawing more cards, so I can kind of be a little bit more relaxed with uh, with my resources because I'm going to draw into a lot more cards anyway. Showing my hand, I believe six or seven cards in there, a lot. And Nicholas is doing the trade. And tapping for a new Suchi. Suchi number three. Wow, drawing lots of Suchis in this game. Not finding a trike yet. I'm only playing with the nine creatures, of course. Four Suchis, four Triskelions, and one Atok. Let's see what Nicholas can do here. Tapping five. Okay, Sengir Vampire. He's putting some of his beefier creatures on the board now. Sarah Angel and Sengir. And he's actually only playing with six creatures and, of course, also four Mishra's Factory. So three Sarah Angels... Three Singer Vampires and four Mishra's Factories. So his deck is really about control, I guess. There's an attack with the Suchi. I'm offering the trade again. This time he's choosing to take the damage. Going to drop to 14. Look at how many cards I haven't had. I wonder what I have. I'm actually forgetting here to tap down the Factory. The Howling Mine, I mean. So that is a mistake. I wonder if Nicholas took two cards... Oh, okay, I remember I discussed it with him and he said, okay, I'll... He said, you can take it back. I don't want to draw the extra cards. That's really nice of you, Nicholas. I uh, I respect that, but it was my mistake. So it would have been okay if you draw, drew the extra card as well. You need to learn, right? And sometimes it's good to learn the hard way. When you make a mistake, just let your opponent take advantage from it. Anyway, Nicholas has attacked with the Sengir Vampire. I'm on 16 Drawing two cards again. Oh, Library of Alexandria. Maybe that's why I kept those cards in hand to make matters worse. Oh, but I'm just playing out cards nonetheless. Okay, now I've got seven and now I'm able to use the Loa. Now I see. So I've played the Soul Ring, used the Loa. Eight cards in hand. Now seven cards in hand again. There is the Thomas's Coffin that I can start using to put his Sengir in the coffin. Deciding not to do it yet. Is Thomas's Coffin 2 to activate and not 3? I think earlier I thought it was 3 to activate. I guess it's 2 to activate because I've got 2 mana open. We'll just have to wait and see what's going to happen next. So of course I've got that Relic Bearer to possibly tap the Icy again. So he's first going to attack. Or not. He's, he's taking it back. Okay, he's first going to tap my Suchi. Then he's going to animate. Oh, he's got two Mishra's Factories. I kind of missed that. I'm tapping one of his Factories. He's, of course, using the other one to pump. So he's dealing seven damage. I'm going from 14, um, sorry, from 16 to nine. And he's playing a Time Walk. Ooh, this is going to be really risky. He can hit me for eight now. Whoa, I'm almost dead. So despite, oh, wait a minute. I was on eight, I guess. I was on nine. I mean, okay, I'm going to go to one. It's going to deal 8 damage. Oh, man. And I guess the Thomas' Coffin is 3 to activate, by the way. Wow. The Time Walk is almost giving Nicholas the victory. Is he going to just win it here? He does play with more Cyblast in his deck. All he needs is one more point of damage, and I'm dead. Remember, Nicholas started this match, this game, with 5 cards in hand. I've had a Howling Mine and a Relic Barrier up for I don't know how many turns... So I've been drawing tons more cards than Nicholas. And despite that fact, Nicholas' life is on 14 and I'm on 1. Is Nicholas going to win this? If he's got a Cyblast, he's 1, right? Unless I've got a Swords in hand or something. So he's going to do some tapping. Tapping my Suchi. Animating. Oh, is he going to win? He's going to attack. Okay, I'm using Tansa's Coffin. Putting the Sengir in the coffin, tapping one of his factories. Factory's now at 3-3. Three, three. Is there a disenchant? Oh, there's a disenchant. Okay. Okay, so I've survived this one. I've survived. I needed all my resources, but I've survived. There is a sinkhole. Ooh, if it would have played that sinkhole earlier. Ooh, maybe he would have won. I wonder if that's the case. I think it is the case if it would have played that sinkhole. Ooh, really lucky here. And the Sengir is just in the coffin, by the way. We kind of see it flying away and uh, flying on Nicholas's screen, but it's it's in my Thomas's coffin. 
Uh, I'm now going to attack, hit him for four. He's on 10, but I'm, I'm not really feeling relaxed here. I'm on one <laughs> life. I mean, I've got control because, hey, I'm drawing more cards, so I've got more answers. But uh, this is difficult. Passing turn here. And now Nicholas only has that single Mishra's Factory. Ooh, but wait a minute. He can tap down my Relic Barrier. Animate the Factory. Whoa. Okay, but of course I had the Suchi still to block with. Okay, yeah, that's, that's, that's true. For a moment there, I thought that I missed something. And can Nicholas win it in this turn? Attacking for four again. He's going to go to six. Playing a Triskelion. Was my Suchi tapped there, actually? Hmm. Not really sure. I thought maybe there was an option there for Nicholas to attack with that factor, but maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, let's see how the rest of the match um, continues here. There we see that activation of the Icy Manipulator. It looks like I'm going to respond to that. Ooh, I'm going to source my own Suchi. Going to gain four life. Going to go to five. That is interesting. Oh, so he didn't want to tap my trike. He wanted to tap my, he tapped my plateau, of course. And in response, I used my plateau to cast the swords to plowshares on my own Suchi. Now he's animating the factory. I'm tapping the factory. I think I can win this now because I can attack with my trike and deal four damage. Exactly. He's going to go to two and then I can use my trike and kill Nicholas. Wow. Nicholas. Really respect for you in this game one. You started with five cards and you fought your way completely back. You almost killed me. I thought you did have a few openings there. Let's actually go back to that moment where I think you could have tapped down my Relic Barrier and then attacked with your Factory. But maybe I saw it wrong. Let's just have another look at that uh, part of the match. And this is the part that I'm talking about here. I see an untapped Icy Manipulator. He can use it to tap my Relic Barrier, then activate uh, his Mishra's Factory. I think that because I have the Plateau open and I've got a handful of cards, and I believe we actually talked about this as well, Nicholas, now I remember, is that um, the chance was just so big um, for you to run in like a Disenchant or, you know, um, a, a sword to plowshares. I just have so many weapons that you were like, okay, I, I'd rather have my Mishra's Factory on a, on a blocking duty. You had a, a, a different line in mind, but there was, of course, an opening. And spoiler alert, I did have a, a sword and I think also a disenchant in hand here. So it wouldn't have mattered much, but still, there was a little, little opener. Anyway, um, let's just go to game two. This was so much fun, game one. Let's check out game two. Game number two, here we go. Nicholas on the play. I don't think he's taking a mulligan this time. So that's good news already for you, Nicholas. At least you get to start with seven. Or did, ooh, I think you did take. Oh, there's an essential recall. Okay, so just let me correct here. He did take a mulligan, but in his new hand, he found an essential recall. So I'm not feeling sorry for you, Nicholas. That's pretty good. But. It's fair, because remember game one, you started just started with five. Anyway, uh, playing a Scrubland here, having an Underground Sea Scrubland and a Mox Pearl on the battlefield. Look at what I've got. Oh yeah, another Mox, why not? I only have a single Urtz's Tower. Ah, uh, sad little Urtz's Tower. There is the pass. There we see a City of Brass taking a damage here, going to 19, playing a Relic Barrier. Again, pretty handy, because it allows me to tap down one of his Mox. And remember, Nicholas is playing with, you know, it's 4-4 flying 5 drops, so I really want to, you know, tap it down and make sure that he cannot play out those cards. There's a strip mine on my City of Brass. That is super annoying. I really need my color fixing. Ooh, this is bad. Passing turn, not playing out any land. So I guess I kept a 2-lander with Relic Barrier in hand. Perhaps I also have a Howling Mine in hand, you know. And if I can get those two cards... Okay, let's see if there's a Howling Mine. Yeah, there's a Howling Mine. Okay, so that's probably the reason why I kept the hand. Because I had a Relic Barrier and... Oh! Divine Offering coming in from the sideboard probably. Great card. Getting rid of the Relic Barrier. Very clever. That means Nicholas gets to draw two cards. Ooh, this is bad news. 
I think he's tapping to exactly. This is enough. Sing your vampire four four. Okay, I get to draw two cards at least. I want to say, can I get Tron? I cannot, it seems. Playing City of Brass. Is there a Swords to Plowshares here? Going to 18. There is a Swords. Nicholas gaining four more life. He's really going up here. Of course, gained life from his Divine Offering. Now gaining life from that Swords to Plowshares. Looks like he's looking for another die. And... Um, Or is he? I'm not quite sure what he's doing. Anyway, he's on He's on a lot of more life than I am, uh, I believe. Okay, there's the, he was, was looking for a dice. Anyway, uh, he's now on 26, which makes sense because the Divine Offering on Relic and the Swords on Sengir. And he's playing out Felverstone, pointing out my own City of Brass. So this is great news for Nicholas that Felverstone is now a magical stone. It can make any color mana. It's so good when your opponent has a city of brass on the battlefield, so good. Anyway, let's see what else he's gonna do. There is a disenchant on the winter orb that I just cast. And you see now, because Nicholas, of course, is taking full advantage of my Howling Mine as well, he's finding the answers that he needs, you know, finding the divine offering, the disenchants. And that's, of course, a big problem for me because I really want to have what I had in game one where I can just use my Relic Barrier on my Artifacts, have that Parfait Package, a Mind Twist! Oh, man, that is nasty! It, I was already not winning, and now I'm not not winning. So that means I'm losing. But I'm, I'm still in it. As long as you're in it, you can still win it. I've seen weirder stuff. I'm just going to continue, going to keep my head up high, but that Mind Twist is brutal. So, yeah, pointing out that he gets to draw another card. Sorry, I just have to laugh. But look at that. Nicholas not really doing anything, not really finding anything. So I guess that is my luck. Despite the fact that he's got tons of mana, drawing tons of cards, he's just passing turn again. So it's actually not that bad. There is another Urtz's Mine. And passing turn. There we see that beautiful altered... Black Lotus, I have to be honest. No, it's actually, this is not the Black Lotus. Is this the Jet? I mean, yeah, it is the Black Lotus. This camera isn't really doing it any credits, to be honest. So sorry for that, Nicholas. But we can't really see your beautiful altar. Anyway, we, we looked at it in the, uh, in the introduction. But, I mean, this is kind of a weird situation, right? Because Nicholas is drawing so many cards. He's got so much mana. But I guess he's just drawing Lance or something? He's not really able to, to really have used that Mind Twist to his advantage for the simple reason that he's not casting out any threats. Not able to find Sarah Angels. Or are we going to see a Sarah Angel now? Okay, there's a Sarah Angel. So finally, he can put some pressure on. No, he cannot because there's another Swords. Of course, a life total of Necklace ticking up further. Um, he wasn't 26. Now he's on 30. And look at that. I'm not even able to make Tron. I've got three mines, one tower, two city of brasses. It's so funny. Like we're drawing cards like crazy. Oh, Aloha on the side of Nicholas kind of missed that. Anyway, Nicholas even drawing three cards a turn, an ancestral recall a turn. But still, there's not so much happening. Okay, there's a disenchant. Ooh, taking care of the howling mine. That is a really good move. There is a sinkhole taking care of one of the City of Brasses. If he can sinkhole the other one, I don't have access to white mana anymore. Ooh, finding another one. This is a power plant. I've got Tron actually. Oh, what am I doing? Playing a huge disintegrate. Let's see for how much. 2, 4, 6, 8, 11, 13, 14. A disintegrate for 14. And there we can see the life total of Nicholas going down. So he's going down all the way to 16, of course, being on 30 before, but he's still on 16 life. And remember, I have that Winter Orb that's now actually gonna work against me because, I mean, I'm gonna start untapping. I wonder if maybe I have that second Fireball in hand or maybe I'm hoping for that. Of course, I'm playing towards my outs and the fact of the matter is that Nicholas is unable to put a lot of pressure on you know, he's just, I guess, drawing lands and a few creatures that he's been able to play out have been able to destroy with my swords. I've played two swords so far this turn, one on the Sengir and uh, one on the Sarah Angel. 
Let's see, is he gonna play out another big creature? He is tapping a lot of mana. Ooh, Brain Geyser, that's even better. He's gonna draw into so many more cards. He will have to discard a bunch though. Okay, there we can see a Sarah Angel in his hand. Is he gonna, he's gonna sack the Lotus here to cast that Angel it seems. That's what he does. So the Lotus is gonna go and now he's gonna discard, probably just gonna discard a whole bunch of, bunch of lands here. There we see a Sengir in hand. And what is he gonna put in the graveyard? Not that Sengir, of course. He, wanna, he wants to keep his creatures because he wants to put pressure on. Yeah, two swords to plowshares and a lot of land. That makes absolute sense. And passing turn here. Can I find more swords? Remember, I already have two swords in the bin. I play three main. I probably board it in number four. So I'm probably playing with four swords. Um, I can also board in some mazes. Maybe I did that as well. I wonder if I did that. Because mazes are also good, but not so great with a winter orb. There's the attack by the Sarah. So I'm going to drop to 12. So I'm on a three turn clock here. Wonder if Nicholas is gonna play out some more pressure. There is a Chaos Orb. Is he gonna use the orb? Actually, I wouldn't mind. Okay, so he's gonna exactly he wants to use it in response before targets are chosen. I'm gonna disenchant my own winter orb here. Ooh, that's interesting. I'm disenchanting my own winter orb. So I guess in a way I'm saying. You know, I want to make sure that I can still cast my Disenchant on my Winter Orb. And maybe you're thinking, why not play it on the Chaos Orb? That could have been an option as well. But what I want to do is I want to make sure that I can play... Oh, taking out my Urza's Tower. I want to say I want to make sure I can play a Burn Spell. And I think when I'm looking back at this, I'm kind of wondering why didn't I just Disenchant the um the chaos orb was i afraid of a count no i think it's just a misplay i'm not sure how why i was why i did this why I didn't just disenchant the chaos orb i think if i disenchanted the chaos orb um the only difference of the board set was that it still would have had tron so this is kind of a weird well, then, of course, I, I, I would have still had my Winter Orb. That's the problem. I wanted to get rid of my own Winter Orb. Anyway, oh, I've got Tron again playing a huge Fireball for the victory here, it seems. Can I play it big enough? I think I can. So I'm going to play it on Nicholas's life total. I'm going to play it for 6, 8, 10, 13, 15. There is that Relic Barrier. Or, sorry, that Divine Offering. But that's not going to... Oh, it's going to give him some life. Oh, that Relic Barrier is going to keep him on one. Oh, man, so close. I almost had you, Nicholas, and now you've got the game. Bam, I almost had you. Okay, um, boys and girls, what I'm going to do now is I would like to go back to that moment where I decided to disenchant my own Winter Orb and kind of explain why I did this, that because there is reasoning behind it. Um, but first, wow, what a game number two. Nicholas, this is a great match, man. Um, wow. And again, what's so interesting here is this time Nicholas had all the card advantage, especially after the mind twist, but I guess he couldn't really find what he was looking for. And that kind of gave me the opportunity to play that huge disintegrate and almost win the match with that huge fireball. What an incredible game two this was. Um, let's now kind of um, go back uh, to that moment where I disenchanted my own Winter Orb. So this is the moment where Nicholas is going to play his Chaos Orb. Now this is the problem. I was planning to play out my disenchant in the end step of Nicholas on my own uh, Winter Orb. The thing is with Chaos Orb is you say, I'm going to use my Chaos Orb. I'm going to pay one. I'm going to use it. You don't have to say what you're going to target. So I don't know if he's going to target my City of Brass or any other card. I'm assuming he's going to target my City of Brass. He wants to stop me from having white mana, right? Because white mana can kill his creatures. So what I did in response, I say I'm going to tap my City of Brass for one white. I'm going to tap the white in the ruby. I'm going to play a disenchant 
on my winter orb. Now, the mistake I made here, I guess, the little mistake is I could have said, I'm going to keep the um, I'm going to keep the winter orb, and uh, or I'm going to keep one white floating in the mana pool because the one ma white mana stays there until the end of the main phase of Nicholas. But let's say I would have used the mana for the disenchant on the chaos orb of Nicholas. What would have happened is the chaos orb got destroyed. It wouldn't have worked. The problem of that scenario is that I wouldn't have been able to untap my Tron lands and play a huge fireball. As you can see, I have so many lands still that are tapped. It would take me forever before I would be able to untap all those lands, cast my huge fireball. I would be dead because look at my life total. I'm on 11. He's got a Sarah Angel. He probably has more creatures in hand. I, I'm going to die. I've got three turns max, but probably only two turns. So I really have to get those lands untapped. And that is the reason why I decided to play a disenchant on my own winter orb. And you know what? It almost worked. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to explain this to you and to myself. <laughs> uh, wow, man, what a great game. Uh, game number two it was. Now it's time to dive into game number three. Game number three. Here we go. The Decider. Oh, man, it's game one and two. Great, great matches. Unbelievable. Oh, okay, game three. I'm on the play, starting with an Urza's Tower and a pass turn. Let's see what my opponent, Nicholas, is going to do here. He's, of course, on the draw here. I'm hoping to maybe assemble Tron. Natural Tron would be nice. Like play Urza's Tower, Urza's Power Plant, Urza's Mine. That would be sweet. Anyway, Nicholas starting here with a Mishra's Factory. Pass turn. There is a plateau. No, there's no relic barrier, no winter orbs, no howling mines, no nothing. Just keeping this open. Of course, it does mean that I can play a potential disenchant. It looks like Nicholas is not animating, instead choosing to play a Felwer Stone. Makes sense. That's not a risk you want to take against a player who plays with swords and disenchant to then animate that just for two damage. Anyway, playing City of Brass, taking a damage, tapping three here. Ooh, Blood Moon! Blood Moon, boarded into Blood Moons. Talked about this in the deck deck. This is killer for Nicholas. Remember, the Felwer Stone can only make red mana now. So we both just have three red mana. I have three red mana, and he's going to play another red mana? Another red mana. Yeah, I think this Blood Moon is an absolute killer. This is going to be so tough for Nicholas. For, you know, for, for him, it's, it's, he's probably hoping just to draw a Mox, or better even, maybe a Black Lotus to find the colors that he needs. But until that time, I think it's going to be really tough for him. I'm playing out land number four, four mountains now, casting a Suchi, 4-4 four, four Suchi. And yeah, I mean, remember, he doesn't have blue mana to cast Psyblast. He doesn't have white mana to cast Swords. I guess the best card for him... Yeah, Mox Ruby. That's the worst Mox he could have drawn in this in this situation i guess he needs an icy that would kind of help him remember the strip mine is also a mountain tapping something at least he's going to do something tapping four okay jam day tome not too bad that's not too bad he can start using his jam day tome because remember i don't have any white mana either so i cannot play out any disenchant on that tome so i'm just going to attack him here for four it's going to drop to 16 but now he can at least start using the book and he's got a, got a couple of cards that that are um, you know that can kind of help him here but ooh there is another suchi on the board really bad news for nicholas he's already on 16 he's now on a two turn clock he's probably going to use the book if he cannot find another answer there's another mountain in the form of a city of brass tapping four here is going to try to dig for answers Probably hoping for a Mox Pearl if he has a Disenchant in hand. Mox Pearl or Black Lotus would, would allow him, if he has a Disenchant, to take care of that Blood Moon. So now I would have had Tron, but because of Blood Moon, I just have a lot of mountains. But I don't really mind, because I can still play out my artifacts. Tapping three here. Another Blood Moon! Attacking for two. It's actually really good if you have two Blood Moons to play them both. Why, if your opponent on end step for some reason, or just whenever, uh, finds a moment to get rid of your one Blood Moon. Remember, he all of a sudden, he's got all his colored mana again. So by adding two to the mix, I'm going to make it extra difficult for Nicholas to get back from this. He only has one more turn. There's a Loa. 
Is this killed by Blood Moon? Or Blood Moons, I should say. He's gonna go for another card. What is he really hoping for? Just two cards in hand. And we see Sengir Vet. No, he's got nothing. Nothing in hand. And the Blood Moon just completely shut his deck down. And this is, of course, a risk uh, when you're playing with a lot of duels and, and no basics. It just happens sometimes. And I think I boarded in my three Blood Moons on game number three somehow. I didn't do that on the first game. And this is really a Blood Moon victory for me. But I have to be honest here, Nicholas. For me, okay, game three is kind of nice to see the power of Blood Moon. But game one and two, fantastic games. Nicholas, thank you so much. I'm going to do another shout out here to your um to your altars page man because uh you deserve it and also your altars just look really really good so check out his uh, facebook page facebook.com slash wizorior a so that's wizorior altars where you can get in touch with him if you want some of your cards to be altered um thank you very much nicholas for this game and i also would like to thank you the viewer for watching another episode right here on timmy talks the channel where we talk old school magic and if you liked what you see and you're new to the channel first off welcome please consider to subscribe hit that bell and of course leave a like leave a comment that all really helps the channel grow so also if you're in already a subscriber and you've been here tons of times before welcome welcome back please hit that like button it really helps a lot and also leave a comment um what else is there to say oh wait a minute i'm forgetting yes of course you can also become a patron of the channel uh just like nicholas actually he just joined our patreon program and become became a patron of timmy talks the cool thing about that is that if you want to you can play an old school match against me um, and also your name will be mentioned in the end scroll and we also have our own discord and I also organize uh, tournaments to thank my channel members and patrons for their support. I don't do it like every month, but every every couple of months I organize something as a thank you. So if you think, oh, it would be fun to join those tournaments or it would be fun to just, you know, support a content maker that I really enjoy and I hope that's me, um, just check out the Timmy Talks Patreon page and, and you can see how you can get started and how you can support this YouTube channel. It already starts with $1 a month. That having said, um, let's go to the end scroll and let's take a look at our fantastic, amazing channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. Ikitus, ikitus, somba, kazik!